Do you wonder if others are dealing with the same project management challenges as you? Not sure where to turn for guidance and leadership? Office Hours are in session as we discuss project management and PMOs with global leaders, hearing their story and learning their secrets to success. Our goal is to empower you and help you elevate your PMO and project management career to new heights. Welcome back to Project Management Office Hours with your host, PMO Joe. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours. We're the number one live project management radio show in the U.S., broadcasting to you from the Phoenix Business Radio X studios in Tempe, Arizona. I'm your host, PMO Joe, and for the next hour, we'll be talking project management. Before we jump into the show today, I wanted to mention uh, next week on March 10th, I'll be a guest of Stuart Easton's and his webinar series that he hosts through his company, Transparent Choice. That'll be on March 10th at 9 a.m. Arizona time. Stuart is over in the UK. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what local time it'll be uh, over there, but we're going to be talking about PMO leadership and digging into how we can improve overall PMO performance by improving the leadership that we have within our PMOs. And then later in the year, I'll be uh, just confirmed, I'll be speaking at Boston University's Project Management and Practice Conference in June and the ASU Project Management Summit in September. I had the good fortune to uh, present at both of those last year. They're great events, and I'll be back again this year. So uh, everybody take a moment, go out there, Google Boston University Project Management and Practice and uh, the ASU PM Summit. That's not That site's not quite up yet, but that'll be out there soon. Of course, we also want to thank our sponsors, the PMO Squad and the PMO Leader. The PMO Squad is the premier PMO consulting firm in the United States. You can learn more about them at www.thepmosquad.com. And the PMO Leader is a new global platform. It's the only true global platform that's e-commerce based for project management leaders and teams in the world, we believe. And you can learn more about that, of course, by visiting that site at www.thepmoleader.com. And finally, a reminder for everyone that Project Management Office Hours is a podcast, even though we're live right now. And if you want to see uh, upcoming guests and listen to our previous episodes, go out and visit the projectmanagementofficehours.com website uh, to see all the good content we have out there. So with all of that, I am super excited today to be joined by our special guest, Bill Dow. Thank you, Bill, for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. I'm excited to be here. It's been a long time. We've been trying to schedule this for a while. Actually, back in the day when you only did in person, if you may remember. Yeah, yeah, we we were trying to coordinate schedule. I bet I reached out over a year and a half. I bet close to two years ago we started to get this. But, uh, you know, we hosted a clubhouse room together last Saturday, and now here we are on the radio. Uh, So it's fantastic. If you could take a moment, Bill, to say hello to the listeners and share a little bit about yourself so they get to know more about who you are. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, as you said, my name is Bill Dow. I have 30 years in the PMO and project management space. Um, I'm a speaker around the world, so I've spoken from uh, London, England, to Las Vegas, to Toronto, to Vancouver, to San Diego, so coast to coast from U.S. to Canada. Um, I've written four books, so two on project communications, two on PMOs. Um, My project communication tools book is still out there, very active. It's actually sold in a a number of universities and colleges. So that kind of keeps that that, um, engine going. Um, And so, yeah. And so one of the, you know, claim to fame is I've managed 10 PMOs. And so uh, two at AT AT&T and Singular, seven at Microsoft, and now my largest PMO at the University of Washington. And so really, really excited about kind of sharing that experience and my, uh, my background today. And uh, Bill also was, you were one of the, were you one of the finalists or one of the top 15 for PMO leaders of the year last year? Yeah, uh, top 15 in the leaders or 16 or something in the PMO leaders. So, yep. Yeah, and that's through the PMO Global Alliance. Uh, so obviously a lot of history and experience in the industry. And we have you out on the PMO leader site as well. So yeah. you're out there as a speaker, your books, and uh, yeah. getting some of your training and all that stuff out there as well. So there. Yeah. thanks so much, Bill. Let's talk project management, right? Let's yeah. dig in. Let's jump in. Okay. And, uh, you know, for us, we always like to 
uh, have on our show, not just the technical side of project management, but the journey, right? How, how do we get to where we are today? And as you mentioned, you've had 10 PMOs and you yeah. know, that takes time, right? 30 years worth of experience. What's that journey like for you? How's that? Yeah. How well, that it actually, I got to take it back. I got to take it back to 1991, actually, uh, when I managed my first project. So, you know, like most PMO managers or directors, we all generally start from being project managers. You just don't magically become a PMO manager director. But in 1991, I was working at Ministry of Transportation and Highways in Victoria, BC. And I was actually moving two big projects. They were on the mainframe and they were moving to Oracle. And so back in the mainframe days, right? And so a long time ago, so one was called the Rockfall Hazardous Rating System. And it was a very, very complicated project because what we did is we had to go inventory every rock slope in the province of BC. Oh, wow. Uh, because from a safety perspective, so if a rock would fall onto a car on a highway, we needed to, from a legal perspective, we needed to know the characteristics of that, of that rock slope. So that was one of my first projects I ever managed. Um, and then I jumped into another project, which was called Railway Crossing Inventory System, which was the same thing, was mainframe to Oracle. And just the nuances of get, taking people off a of mainframe onto an Oracle client server uh, back at the time was just very complicated. And Railway Crossing was the same thing. We had to safety and do the inventory of, uh, of those projects. And that, that, I fell in love with project management then. I fell in love with driving teams and organizing teams and really passionate about, you know, how can I make these projects successful? And how do I drive the success of the projects? So from there, I did that for about nine years or so. And then I jumped to a PMO manager. Um, and then I jumped to a portfolio manager. And then I jumped to a program manager. And then back to a project manager. And then back to a PMO manager and now a PMO director. So it's been a ride, but what it really has been interesting to do all those various roles because you come at these roles from different characteristics. But my heart, my passion is still in project management. And therefore, as I drive and deliver these PMOs, I think it really, that passion and that excitement comes out on a regular basis as I try to execute and make the PMOs better. You know, and back uh, when you and I were in college, uh, they didn't have... <laughs> project management degrees, right? So no. what were you doing before in 91 before you became a PM, right? I mean, what's yeah. like, Developer? I was, I was just an accidental PM like you, right? I mean, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't think, I didn't even know what a project manager was, right? I didn't even know that was a role. So I started as a developer in X space. Okay. And so, uh, yeah. And then from there, I went to business analysis and was a BA and writing BRDs. And, and I said, okay, I gotta, can I have a chance at running these projects? And, you know, it was still relatively new, Nine, you know, 91, Project Management was still new. And, and so we said, okay, let, you know, let's, let's let them take a shot at these. And I got these two mainframe projects and they were, it was amazing experience and it was across the province and there was so much goodness about it, but it really did have me fall in love with it, with the industry. And what do you think? You learn like that transition because almost every guest we have on, right, tells us about this accidental project management yeah. journey that they start on. And several were developers, right? When they started, yep. I know Ben Aston, the digital project manager who's up in your your area in Vancouver. Yep. He, uh, he, you know, he has a, he was a developer and he's now uh, in the project management space. What is it about that switch, right? From being the team member developer to the team leader on the project itself? What was it about that that yeah, really brought I, you in? I, I love the leadership components. I love the coordination components. I, I really love the fact that you needed to drive the execution of the team. And so when, when we made that switch, it was really about, okay, let's gather, let's get this team together to, to execute this one project. And when I was a developer, I loved the developing. I loved that. And I think that still helps me today, having that core development skills and background. Um, but when you make that switch, it's really about driving that team and making that team drive forward. And I just love that aspect of it. Yeah, it completely makes sense. And then, of course, the, the journey up the proverbial corporate ladder, right, yeah. to hit all the different roles. 
How do you, you know, as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking with Stuart Easton next week about PMO leadership, yeah. and, and you've gotten experience there. We've done some survey work, and we found that it's close to 80% of first-time PMO leaders were project managers, right, promoted up yeah. into a manager role. And then they they do horrible, right? They fail miserably. Yeah. What do you think are some of the key things that differentiate being a project manager from being a PMO leader? Yeah. So one of the key components of project management is you go deep. You really understand your project end to end. You know all the aspects of what's going down. A PMO leader has to look wide. Right. And so it's really, really important that you're looking at the organization as a whole and, and really looking at how do you sell that organization? How do you drive this wide view compared to this depth? And a lot of project managers struggle, or sorry, a lot of PMO managers struggle with making that transition. And so when I talked about popping from a portfolio manager to a project manager to a program manager, it allowed me to have that wider view that sometimes PMO managers who become accidental, they go from project, superstar project manager to the PMO manager, they don't get that wide view right away. Therefore, they think they can still manage every project. They think they can still go deep on every project, and you just can't do that. You have to shift to running an org, running an organization, than running a particular project. And there's different skill sets. So how do we as industry leaders communicate to organizational leaders that they need to be prepping or training or preparing PMO managers and directors to be leaders and not just project managers? What can we do to help yeah. improve that? Well, let me let me kind of side ask that question in a different way. Yeah. What do we do to make an HR director a leader? Yeah. What do we do to make a finance director a leader? Right? Because when I look at these organizations and I look at a PMO, I look at that that PMO manager director, whatever your case, as the same as these HRs and finance and marketing and sales. So it's not about just kind of singling out, is what do organizations do to make their leaders overall better at running their organizations? And that is people skills, leadership skills, compassion skills, right? That is really driving an organization as a whole. Doesn't matter necessarily which particular one. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, we have examples throughout the organization where it works, right? I mean, yeah. But what yeah. we, the, the challenge or a challenge, right, is we bury the PMO inside another department. Right. Usually it becomes yeah. the IT PMO as opposed to HR is the yeah. organization's HR department. Yeah. Marketing is the organization's marketing department. Yeah. So that that's where I wonder if there's a challenge by burying it within a department. Maybe they're not getting the same access to leadership skills because they're a, they're kind of a sub function and not the, the an actual function. Yeah, and every company is going to differ, right? Yeah. Based on the size and the complexity of Microsoft, which will have multiple layers, could put their PMOs in various places. So yeah, so generally 100% right. They generally fall in IT. But I mean, we need to change that conversation. Let's have it fall at the same place finance and HR does. Um, and then that would fundamentally change how PMO directors are looked at. Yeah, it makes sense. And and certainly we don't want to always just look at what fails, right? But PMOs succeed, right? There's tremendous, yeah. tremendous value in having a PMO. W what are some of the things you've, you know, gathered over the years as to how PMOs can be successful? Where where are they successful? Yeah, so there's a there's a couple components to that. So I think when, when we look at the success of a PMO, I think the first thing we have to look at is what value is it bringing to the organization? right? Kind of a default standard answer. I get that. But across the 10 PMOs, I'm always asked that question. Like, what do you bring? Like, what value you bring, right? And so what I do is I fall back to a lot of it with the project management, right? So the projects are delivering on time and on budget. And I think the standard corporate answer is, and with value, and I just want to challenge that a little bit. And so I, I still strongly believe that projects have to deliver on time and on budget. Totally get that. And that helps drive the organization. But when we think about value, I just want to pivot that conversation a little bit and say, look at the success rate of our projects still. 
right? I think you quoted it. Our projects continue to fail. And so no, we don't deliver on time and on budget. So don't even add value. Don't add those other things yet. Let's just nail on time and on budget first. And then we can start adding value. Because when I think about value, a lot of times it's on the team or the, pro the project team or the project manager to deliver that value. And I don't believe that's the case. I think it's on the organization who's receiving the project. Because my project managers are working on three or four projects right now. They have no time to collect value that could take six, eight, two, three years to actually re realize. So I'd like to so pivot the conversation. What I've been doing is pivoting and saying, you know what? We will nail our on time. We will nail our on budget, right? We'll nail that first. And then we crawl, walk, run. We'll add some additional features. And one of the things that we find is quality, right? Quality is a huge component and quality has gone out the window. And so, you know, I really feel like we need to nail the basics. And, you know, when you think about quality, right, you think about some of uh, the couple of mobile phone things, right? And so when new releases come out, instead of downloading that mobile phone right away, I look and I search and they go, don't do it, don't do it. We have to patch the patch that just got patched, right? And so I think we got to bring back a different view of that and, and really look at, on time, on budget, nail that first, and then maybe drive quality. But from a PMO manager perspective, you were saying, like, what are the, some of the things they can do? I think there's three or four key points, right? They have to first understand relationships. They need to have a seat at the, at the leadership table, and they need to have good relationships all across the leadership. Right, They need to be able to know that they can go and speak to any leader about what their organization is doing what they're doing, what they're, right, and have that organization talk, and they, and they have that good seat at the table. They need to know the strengths and weaknesses of their own PMO, right? I think that's critical, right? We've got superstars. We've got folks that are still developing. Who do we put on? How do we adjust? How do we set up our projects for success? I think that's a key component. I think they need to know the subject area, right? I think they need to know project management, because what happens is, and I face it every day, is I have project managers that come to me and say, I'm having trouble with my project. What would you do? I know you've managed projects before. Can I get some advice? If you plop a PMO leader in that has no experience managing projects, then I think they're really going to struggle going, I really don't know how I can help you with this. You know, so I think that component of knowing that subject area is critical. Um, and then one thing, and I know you probably won't like this, but I think you have to sell the PMO. I think you're constantly selling the PMO. So what do I mean by that, right? What I mean is you're selling your organization, you're selling your people, you're selling what your PMO can bring, right? I've been doing PM, 10 PMOs, I've seen PMOs shut down. I've seen PMOs, right? And so if you're not constantly selling and having that elevator speech, and selling what your people can do, I think you're going to struggle. And I know there's lots of talks, don't sell your PMO and stuff. I'm always selling, and my people know I'm selling on behalf of them, and it's actually worked out very nicely. Yeah, I, I, no, arg no argument for me on selling. We've, we've actually had some sales experts on our show yeah. to try to be able to bring some skills to the, the project management leader to help them know that they have to sell. And yeah. even in the PMO squad, uh, our purpose-driven PMO uh, within our measurement section, right? It's purpose, measure, optimize. And in our measure, we say communicate your measurements, right? Too often, yeah. we don't do that. We don't communicate how well we're doing, right? People point out sometimes when we don't do well, but we have to learn that we need to be pounding our chest and letting people know when we have, when we do add that value, when we do have success. Yeah, because, you know, I always go back to that little kind of story, a little question and I say, hey, do you think an HR director has to sell the need for the HR. And people know, clearly there's HR. Do you think a finance director has to sell the need for finance in an organization? No. I think a PMO director has to sell, right? And of course they do, right? We're constantly selling. We have that that other departments don't have. We have the same, we don't have that, they don't have the same pressure. They don't have to lay their head down at night and go, how do I sell my organization tomorrow? where I'm constantly looking at that. 
because PMOs get shut down like this. They, 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 we don't need them anymore. Boom, gone. Yeah. Projects don't go away, but the organization goes away. And I've experienced that, right? And so, um, and so it just it just happens. So if you have that selling mindset, and your people know you're selling on behalf of them, then it really helps solidify you as a leader. Yeah, and that's the, the the one area that I might have some contest with you on is the subject mm-hmm. area expertise. Uh, and again, as you mentioned, depends on the organization, the size of the yeah. company. A smaller PMO, absolutely, I agree with you. It's the maybe in a larger PMO where there's layers of leadership, a director mm-hmm. and then maybe managers. Having yeah. your managers who are the subject matter experts and your director be an organizational leader yeah. expert, their ability to sell if they came out of finance, for instance, or if they came yeah. out of operations or manufacturing, they know how to lead large functions. Yeah. And I think there can be some great value that they could provide to a PMO to be successful. 100%. No, I love that. And I've managed all. Like right now, I have three managers and leads. Uh, I've been a PMO of one. I've been a PMO, right? So I've had the combination of, the, of those uh, different things. And and so I've, I've always had that root of project management in my background. So folks can come and go, hey, what would you do? What would you do? But uh, ideally, you're 100% right. It should go through the manager layer. It's just that passion and that excitement. I'm, I'm more than willing to jump in and, and help out. Give me your project schedule. I'll, I'll whip that off for you. So I just love it. I just absolutely love it. And that shows in, in my organization as well. And, and you had mentioned the statistics, right? So whenever I, I present, I, I think probably every presentation I've ever done anywhere, I'll put up the pulse of the profession yeah. uh, trend graph that shows that we've been flat as an industry. Yeah. Depending if you're listening to Forrester, Gartner, PMI, it depends. But anywhere from only 35 to 55 percent success rates on yeah. projects. Why is that? Right. We've like, invested billions of dollars in technology. We yeah. have more people certified than ever. Yeah. We have more population, right? There's more project managers yeah. or scrum masters. We've even split out the industry yeah. into two different ways to approach it. Yeah. And I come back to leadership. That's why I'm talking about next yeah. week with Stuart is we have never addressed how to prepare a leader within project management. Yeah. All the but certifications you, yeah. are individual based, right? We don't, you we don't have else, that. You know what else has changed though, is the four to five projects that PMs are managing nowadays. Sure. That has not always been a thing, mm-hmm. right? That, that, that has slowly shifted over time, right? Over my 30 years, that has slowly shifted. You'd have two, right? And they'd be big, meaty projects. But we're hearing, and, you know, we interviewed some folks or talked to some folks yesterday, 16 projects, you know, 15, 25, 70. One yeah, lady that, had that, 70. Come yeah, on. in the clubhouse, so one lady yeah. had 70 projects she was running. How is projects. that even possible? Well, and, and if you break that down, right, and there's different sizes of projects, but I think there's an expectation of what you expect a project manager to do, a schedule, a risk log, like the DNA of project management. You can't do that across 70. You can't do that across 10 very well. It's a half right? an hour, so, half an hour, you know, 35, 40 minutes a day per project. Right. I mean, it, 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 it just doesn't work. Sense. Yeah. So, I, and, I, and I, I, love, I love the fact that you brought up Pulse of Profession because I loved, loved that document. I lived by that document. I, 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 was, I, I was dying for it every year. This year wasn't her brain, but um, I loved it because it gave you the facts. Like PMI was out there searching, give me the data, give me the data. And then I would use that and go, I got to key in on this. This is a problem area. This is a problem. I think it was last year where they talked about robots at NASA. I'm going, oh my God, that's awesome. Can you imagine if we actually get to that place? So there's, but I, I can't fathom why we're, we're failing so often. I agree. It is leadership. But even with the best leadership skills on 70 projects, how are you going to do that? On 15 projects, how are you going to show that you're an amazing leader across 70 projects? Well, and that's where you I can't think do the, it. Yeah, the PMO leader has to be able to work within right. the organization to know that you can't have a PM with 70 projects. Right. right? And that's and now in that particular instance, it was a smaller organization where the PM yeah. was the PMO leader and you know, yeah. they were. <laughs> yeah. So again, there isn't a one size fits all, but no. 
you should, your point of this though is you've written about all of it too, right? You've written on the the building, the running, the shutting yep. down, right? You've got the whole life cycle. It's yep. tell us about your most current book, right? That I did. Yeah, I have it right here. PMO life cycle. You probably can't see it, but that's okay. It's called the PMO life cycle: building, running, and shutting down. And what's really fascinating, what I really tried to focus on, it's an upgrade from my uh, tactical guide for building a PMO which was really successful. It's, it's, it's done really, really well, but PMI licensing ran out. And so I updated it. And so this one's called the PMO Lifecycle Building, Running, Shutting Down. And what it has is three components, how to build a PMO, how to run a PMO, and how to shut down a PMO. And what I think I've done is, and it's different from any other book, is it's given that complete life cycle. Right. And so what I find is, is that we have tons of people that will go out and put articles and, and webinars and all that stuff on how to build a PMO, but they never talk about running a PMO and they never talk about shutting down a PMO. And so it's like, whoa, OK, so let's do a little experiment. Right. So if you go on Google and you go how to build a PMO, hundreds and hundreds of, of hits. You go how to run a PMO, me, main, I'm mainly the big hit there. Mm -hmm. You run how to shut down a PMO, I'm the main hit there. So why is that? There's hundreds and hundreds of PMOs out there. Like how, why do all the leaders forget about running a PMO? And why do they forget about shutting down a PMO? Because PMO shut down on a a regular basis, a daily, on a regular basis. Why are we not tackling those three components? Well, my book tackles that because it's very different to build it than it is to run it. And when you're running it, and that's kind of the uniqueness of me still working, but being out there and doing webinars and writing books is because I'm in the heart of COVID. I'm in the heart of running a PMO, and I can share what's really like running a PMO in these organizations. But if you go out there and do the Google searches, it's amazing that these top leaders have missed running and shutting down. They're yeah. just not there. Yeah, it's, what, it's a good point. Think? Yeah, good point. Uh, and obviously the practical experience as someone who's still running them, right? You have that firsthand knowledge. It, you know, I'm going to, uh, the guess is we do such a bad job, we, industry, at building them that there's so much time that people don't even get to the point of how do I run one? Because yeah. I'm, I'm always in that point of, of uh, building and improving. But help me on the, the shutting down part, right? So if yeah. I'm a manager of a PMO, yeah. I don't want to shut down my PMO. I'm going to look be out of a job. Yeah. What, well, sometimes uh, you don't get that choice. <laughs> let's well, <yeah>. be clear. <laughs> sometimes you don't get that choice. Certainly. So, yeah, let's talk about shutting down. So I've shut down multiple um, for a variety of reasons. One was it was a program PMO. And the program got canceled, sure. so you shut down, Yeah, right? One was, hey, you're all getting laid off. We're doing a 14,000-person uh, layoff at a big company. You're shutting it down, right? So there's multiple scenarios. Now, this is, the, this is why I laid that out, because they're shutting down the PMO, and then there's, oh, okay, you get laid off, or they're shutting down the PMO, and you're still there. And so I'm saying you got to start strong and you got to end strong because you don't know what's going to necessarily happen to you at the end of that shutdown. And it's not just about reversing what you built and reversing what you ran. It's about contracts. It's about vendors. It's about, you know, I have software licenses that I, that I got going because it's all PMO software. What happens to that when it shuts down? Shutting down an organization like this is a major component and a major set of steps. And I've outlined those big steps because, frankly, it's not out there. Like, there's, yeah. there's, there's just nothing out there. And so that's where I kind of wrapped it up in that book and, and the end to end. So, if, and again, we want people to go get the book. So one would be where can they get the book? But then second, what are uh, some of the highlights for running? As you mentioned, yeah. right? People are, are building yeah. and shutting. Thank so you. what's running? So where, where can yeah. they get it? And then yep. and then touch on some of the highlights of how to run a yep. PMO. So one of the things I did is I expanded all my markets. Some people just hate Amazon. So I got out of them. I'm on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, on Apple. I'm on every book platform you could possibly imagine. 
because I frankly have people coming to me and saying, hey, can I buy it other than Amazon? So it's everywhere. So you just Google the PMO lifecycle, building, running, come and shutting down, and you'll get it. Um, I love that question about running because when you unpack running, what does that mean, right? Well, there's lots of things that we cover in it, but some of the things are things such as a priority list, okay? When you're building a, a PMO, you're not building out the priority of your projects. You're building an organization. Mm -hmm. So you got to have a priority list. You have to have transition plans. You have to have uh, standard status reports, standard dashboards, right? Some of these things you don't build in the building part because you don't have the data yet. You're just building the org. You're hiring people. You're building it up. But I laid out, I think there's about 16 different components of actually what is you do in building a PMO that's actually built, builds on to from the building part. So you, you build it and then you run it. And there's about 16 parts to running the PMO. So obviously, tremendous experience, lots of uh, content with books and yeah. uh, presentations and others. Yet you're still, you've decided, right, to keep running PMOs, whereas someone like myself, right, I started the PMO squad and we're a consulting firm helping other organizations. Yeah. What's the thought process to stay as a practitioner as opposed to a, a coach or a consultant uh, yeah. and making that sort of transition? That's a great call. And I've been doing that. Um, so my first book, uh, the Project Communication uh, Bible, went out in 2008. So I've been speaking and presenting and webinars and all that since 2008. Um, and so I, so I love that component because I, I love being out there and sharing all that information. But I still want to keep working. I still like being in the heart of, of actually delivering things during the things that are going on now. So, for example, uh, we're in the middle of COVID, right? And so to be part of COVID and moving folks to remote and how do we work in a remote environment, that has just been a tremendous uh, aspect of, of my career. And I still love that. I still love being in the middle of it and growing and driving and, and continue to go. Now, if you know, if, if this PMO gets shut down or we get shipped ship things, maybe I'll make that move. Uh, but right now, I just love it. I just love being in the middle of it especially with these uh, the certain circumstances of the world right now. It's been amazing to be part of it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's certainly a active participant gives you a perspective that yeah. we consultants uh, certainly are out there helping organizations, but you know, it's been eight, eight years. PMO squad just turned eight years. So it's been eight That's years amazing. since I've run a PMO, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I hope it's like and, a bicycle and think I'll never forget how to do it. But, but they're all but unique. things have changed, right? Yeah, things absolutely. have changed, especially with this remote world we're at. Now, what's really funny is, is that, you know, I was involved, I was working in 2000. And so Y2K, we've done the remote thing for a long time, right? Everyone's all up and, oh, we haven't done remote thing. We've done it for 21 years, but what we've done not have done is we haven't had our leaders working from home, right? We haven't had our, our you know, those, that's where the fundamental shift happened because remote work's been around forever, right? Y2K is when it all started. The shift is when the leader sat at home, it made for very differences. And this is why we have Zoom. This is why we have Teams. This is why all that product software and remote software has gone so fast so quickly because the leaders went home and started working from there. But the remote work has been around forever. But things have changed, though. There's no question that fundamentally, when you have your whole organization remotely, you have to do things differently. Yeah, certainly. Uh, it completely makes sense. And obviously, since you're still running PMOs, you've been able to stay closely aligned to the project managers, right? The teams that work for yep. you. What is some of the advice that you can give project managers that are looking for either a new role or an advancement or anything about them? And again, especially in a, a global pandemic, but even outside that. Yeah. Well, you know, the one thing that we see all the time is still a huge need for project managers. And, and, and we've seen Siemens, we've seen HP, we've seen a lot of the big companies have been hiring remote project managers for years. So some advice I would give project managers are twofold. One is I always default back to the art and science. 
I absolutely love that because so many project managers forget that, that there's a relationship, there's a communications, there's, there's that whole softness of, of being uh, um, a leader. And then there's, oh, I need a risk, a log, I need a schedule, I need a project, you know, I need all the goodness of running a project, right? So advice would be when you're thinking about, you know, making a move or, dry, or you know, shifting around, sell and really up your skills in both aspects. Influence without authority, right? Making sure that you can communicate. If you got a chance to sit at the leadership table, what are your leadership skills like? Are you joking? Are you laughing? Are you making crazy marks? Or do you sit there and do present yourself like a leader? Because there's a big difference in that, in that when you get a chance to actually present and talk to leaders, you need to represent yourself that way. But you also need to know the DNA of running a project. And so sometimes you could have the best leader and the best social person in the world, and they're wonderful, but they, they don't have a project schedule. They don't have a risk log. They have, they, you know, there's no status report, right? So there's that blend there. And I think that blend's really, really important. And I think sometimes a, per, a particular person will go to their preference. Oh, I'm a really nice guy and everyone gets along with me. I'll get to my risk and issue stuff later. Or I've got my risk and issue stuff nailed, but no one wants to work for me. And there is a balance there. And so I think you got to do a little self-reflection, but there are a ton of remote jobs. And I just see that's the way that we're going to go um, for the distant future from yeah, a project I'd, management perspective. I'd add into that because that's all great feedback. And then on top of that would be invest in yourself so that yeah. if you're going to be in a remote environment, make sure you have internet capacity in your house that's the right bandwidth. Make yeah. sure that you have a, a, an external microphone, right? I mean, for a hundred dollars to go get a microphone so you can sound appropriately yeah. on your, on your media, leadership meetings as a project manager, right? You don't want to be the person whose mic is cutting in and out right. off of yeah. the, the laptop microphone. Continue to get training, right? Just because you're in a remote setting doesn't mean you can't get trained. Uh, so I, I would say know the art and the science and then invest in both of them. Make sure yeah. that you're continuing to invest in both art and science to help you be successful. But just to, just don't ignore that, right? Like really understand that that's what we're looking for. When I hire a project manager, that is exactly one of the questions I say. Tell me a little bit about art and science and a project manager. What does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and so because you get to the DNA of a person, you know exactly well, you know, I got great risk logs and I got issue logs and all men and one note and I want to go, okay, well, tell me about leadership without an influence or influence without authority or communication skills. Ah, yeah, yeah, something we get to. Oh, okay, right? Like you can really quickly because it's in the DNA of people. They go one way or the, or the other and really a successful project manager has both and will invest in themselves. So in this new world we're in, how do people find roles, right? I mean, do, you know, Here's an example. Yesterday, uh, or this week, rather, the PMO squad is filling a, a need for a client of ours. I was out. I just posted a message on social media. Somebody responds to that message. I send them a link to a Zoom chat. We have an interview within five minutes of posting a position, wow. and they're in front of a client for an interview within an hour. Wow. It's a 100% different world out there, right? I mean, I was, yeah. I was amazed at how quickly we were able to respond to something like that. Yeah. That's the world that's we're amazing. in, right? So how do we yeah. help these project managers? Because obviously lots of downturns, lots of unemployed people out there. Yeah. How do, how do we help them find these new roles? Yeah. And so everyone's going to come from a different perspective, right? So there are people that want to get into project management. There are project managers that are looking for their next role. Everyone's got their own needs. Everyone's got their own desires or salary. It's, going, it's not a case-by-case -case basis, but sometimes a little bit is. And you want to work with that individual to say, what are your needs? What are your, you know, but it's, it's really about getting them skilled, getting them trained. One of the things that I had done for years and, and some of my Microsoft PMOs were I hired project coordinators and project coordinators were very low cost, but they were amazing help to the project managers. And was that ever an amazing experience to get people who are out of school or just getting into the fresh into the environment, gave them project management experience. 
So I would, if I'm looking for a job, I'm looking for coordinator roles. I'm looking for junior project manager roles. I mentor a ton of people and I have that exact conversation. I was uh, mentoring a, folk, uh, a gentleman who just got out of the army. And uh, and he said, hey, how do I get a PM role? And I said, okay, let's look at your experience, let's look at your background, but let's focus on a coordinator. Let's focus on a junior project manager. And hundreds, hundreds of vendor companies will hire these project coordinators because there's always that need out there with that low cost, low entry, skill set entry, but just gives them amazing experience. And then I would point most of the people to the capital. Because I think the captain from PMI has done a great job to get people into the industry and start talking that same language. Um, and so and so that's some of the things where I actually mentor people and they just they they find these these coordinator type or junior project manager type of jobs. Yeah, great insights. And you had mentioned mentoring and military. So that opens yeah. the door for me to talk about VP MMA, <laughs> which is my nonprofit organization. Uh, that we've formed to uh, help just that, right? It's the Veteran Project Manager Mentor Alliance, where we help veterans transition into civilian project management careers. So uh, thanks for, for doing that, not working with my organization, but thank you yeah. just independently for helping veterans yeah. out there with mentoring. It's it's a tremendous need. They're a tremendous skill set they bring to the table. And there's about 250,000 of them every year who exit the military with a good wow. percentage of them uh, capable to be future project manager. So uh, check out VP, the VPMMA.org, everybody who's listening, uh, to see if it's a great opportunity for you to be a mentor and help a veteran come into the project management space. And the gentleman I work with, um, actually, he wrote a white paper. And, 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 and how do you apply the knowledge areas to the Army? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure there's probably a million white papers out there. But on that subject, but I had him write it and then attach it to his resume. And he was like, oh, okay. And so he, had, he got back to me, wrote this white paper. And, and basically he had said, oh yeah, the managers love it. They, this is just like, here, attach your resume, but add this white paper. And if you had known nothing about the army and, you, uh, and if you know nothing about missions and all that stuff, and you apply a mission to the knowledge areas, it's fascinating, right? And so I was like, oh, this is a gold mine. Add that to your resume. You're going to love it. So that was one little tip. And he just, he just, he just jumped all over that. Absolutely. And I know uh, in addition to the mentoring and of course uh, the, the books you've written and running PMOs and presenting, right? All of the things you've done, you've also been a project management trainer, right? So yeah. uh, lots of different training courses you've created what's uh, anything coming up with those or I do, do you, yeah. you know, how can people few. access so, that? Yeah, I do. I have uh, quite a few things going up. So I do have a course I'm shifting um, platforms right now on that course, but I do have a course, the PMO life cycle building, running, shutting down. I have a full course on that 19 modules takes you through building, running and shutting down uh, mentoring sessions. So I have a whole uh, course on that as well. Um, but basically, when I published my first book, the Communication Tools book in 2008, I was approached by a local college. Mm. Um, and so I've been teaching. I taught in Ontario. I taught in, in Vancouver, British Columbia. So I've been teaching and instructing computers for years and years and years. And so when I first wrote that book, they said, hey, at the local college here, Bellevue College, do you want to come teach? So I've been instructing at the college level for years and years. And what I've done is I've branched out because some of the college level classes are not covering the same things. So I did, I wrote a, um, I developed a six hour Power BI class. Oh, wow. So um, how do you, and it's literally, how do you take and build PMO dashboards and PMO, um, basically PMO dashboards and, and Power BI? And I give you sample data and, and how do you do some basic logical data modeling? So it's six hours. Um, we also have June 12th at 830. We're running a project integrations class. Um, and so that class is really about I'm jointly uh, training, uh, teaching that class. And that class is really around how do you kick off a project? How do you run a project? We talk about art and science. We talk about charters. And so I'm literally starting to go, there's so many people that are desperate on how to kick off and how to start a project. And we give them those step-by-step paths on what to do. What do you do weekly? 
what do we expect on a weekly basis? Um, so I've developed, yeah, I've developed about 26 specific project management classes that I'll be rolling out. Um, they're live classes, two to three hours each. And then I've developed 17 PMO classes as well. And I'll be rolling those out um, in, the, in the coming months as well. And again, all exercises, all live, and where you really go deep and we build service offerings and we build all those types of things. Now, are those, if my math is right, 43 courses, right? 26 yeah, and 17. That, yeah. <laughs> are those all through uh, Bellevue College or those no. those will be independent? How, how yeah. can, will, will those be accessible for folks? Yeah, so we're going to build those up. We're going to, we'll have a platform. We'll, have, we'll get them all available. Uh, I'll post all the information up on my site, buildoutpmp.com. We'll get some up on the PMO Leader site. So I'll have them up there. There'll be multiple places where, where people can access them. Uh, the training link is, is going to come up on the project integration class fairly soon. Uh, but basically, yeah, so we'll, we'll have those and be plenty available for people. But I tend to send people to buildoutpmp.com because I put everything up there. Sure. Makes sense. And so when do you sleep, Bill? Uh, books, <laughs> training classes, running a PMO in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I just love it. I just love it. And so, you know, you never work a day in life where you love it, right? And I love this stuff. So I, I do most Saturdays on this stuff. Most Sundays on this stuff is where I spend my time. I never mix the two worlds. I'm off today, day off today. Like I never mix those two worlds. Um, um, and I have never mixed those two worlds. So I'm very, very passionate about being able to stand up and say, I've never done something on your time. It's mm-hmm. all my time, right? And so I do it nights and weekends um, and literally um, just work around the clock, basically, because I'm so passionate about it. I absolutely love it. Well, the other part that I like uh, about what you just shared, right, is there's the, I'd call it the humanity and reality of the project management life uh, is that it's, we're people, right? Uh, and yeah. we're not just robots. We're not just uh, project management managers or PMO leaders. So we have personas, and we're and we have a life. What what's Bill uh, Dow like outside of the PMO world, right? What are some of your other yeah. interests? I always go with I love Roger. And everyone knows what I mean. I love tennis. I love tennis. And I love Roger Federer. And so my life outside of PMOs and project management is coaching. Um, And so I coach tennis. Um, I'm a USPTA elite tennis coach. I play tennis. But I'm also a wheelchair tennis coach. Mm. So I have every uh, every two weeks, I have four to five adult students that are in wheelchairs. And I got myself certified in wheelchair coaching, um, which was a very difficult test, actually. But I got through it. And, uh, and so every two weeks, even during most of the pandemic, we go out and uh, we, we do wheelchair tennis. And I coach the, the players in their wheelchairs. And it's just a huge passion for me. I absolutely love it. I make you know, $20 or something for, for doing it. Yeah. But it's nothing to do with money. I, I just love it. I just love it. It's my same passion for tennis I have for PMOs. Um, and so I really, really love my wheelchair tennis. So, And are, are you able to, in the pandemic, right, are you able to do that? Because obviously coaching, you're, you're yeah. trying to be close to your athlete, yeah. right, to, to help them instruct them. How has yeah. the pandemic influenced that? Yeah. So I stepped away from Able Body because that was a full Saturday where I did six hours or seven hours on Saturdays for Able Body. And I do do wheelchair, but we do it with masks, four on a court, only one coach. There's all the parameters in the world that are set up. We did have a small delay, but we were back last Monday, last Monday night. We were out there hitting and uh, and they're so, they just love it. It's an hour and a half uh, every Monday or every bi-weekly Mondays. And, but with all the parameters and all the masks and all the cleaning and they can't touch balls and there's a whole thing. The USPTA has put out all the rules, but yeah, we do it. We still do it. And so. So I'm, I'm a sports fan. And, and while tennis normally isn't on the top of my list, I, I try to be well-versed in everything. Right. And, and I did not know that's where you were going with, uh, with your sport. So we'll yeah. see if I can keep up with you here, but you love Roger. Oh. Roger's about to get passed by either Rafi or yeah. Novak no uh, to, that, to get more titles. Matter. Where do you think that helps him rank in, oh, in comparison the to them? He's still the GOAT. Doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter. You know why? It's his personality. It's people love Roger. They don't, they love Rafa. They don't love Dokovic. They like Dokovic. They don't love him. They love Roger. Roger instills a passion that just, oh my, it's Roger. Like they, he, there's a passion about Roger Federer that that just leaks to millions around the world. Um, so much so that I tried to get a coin. They put a commemorative coin uh, from Sweden. And it was like sold out, sold out within a minute or something, right? And it was like 100,000 Roger coins and still trying to get my coin. They love them. They, they, a Dokovic coin would not sell out in a minute. I'm telling you, they, they, there's just something about this guy that people just... There, he's just yeah, it's and, amazing. And how do you compare eras, right? So for me, growing up, uh, yeah. Bjorn Borg was my guy, right? He was just, I just, yeah. he was the best, right? But you go from the wooden racket to the modernization of the sport, right? And now it's yeah. just a, it's a different game, right? You play it's a power True. game as opposed to a technique and finesse game. W- yeah. Where would you rank someone um, like a, a Roger Federer? Yeah, I think he would adapt and adjust, but there's not only the rackets, there's the data behind it. There's the science behind it. There's, you know, there's a serve plus one. There's, there's so much data and science and logistics to it that there wasn't there when a a Rod Laver, for example, would go out and play. They just go hit, right? But the rackets have changed the game. The surface has changed the game, the balls, the pressure. Um, there are so many aspects that have changed from those days. And I'm a huge McEnroe fan. I love McEnroe. No, but, um, and, and so, so many things have changed that I think a Roger would have adjusted because ultimately back then was serving volley and that's really where his game is. And so I think he would have adjusted, but I don't know. We will never know. <laughs> I still think he'll be the GOAT and it's not about his numbers. It's about him, the person. So one one last tennis question, and we'll we'll jump back to some project management stuff. But I, <laughs> hey, I'm a sports fan; I could talk all day about tennis. Would be, you know, obviously Bobby Riggs, Billie Jean King, the big thing yeah. back there, man against woman. But the, again, the evolution of the women's game has probably gone more yeah. so than the men's game. Someone like yeah. Serena Williams, amazing. who's absolutely an amazing athlete and personality. How does she compare to what's happening in the men's game? W- would we ever be able to see an opportunity where the, the two sports come together at some events to, to have a combined event? I don't think so. We see mixed doubles, right? Yeah. We see yeah. mixed doubles. And if you ever watch mixed doubles, you know, there's a lot of going after the weaker person, no matter who that is. But I don't see it. I see you see you you've got some big, strong servers and you got some big powerful people and Serena could definitely fall within some of those but the men is just a they you know, they're served at 200 miles an hour right there there's the women are just not hitting at that level I wouldn't even want to see that I, I I think that would just let's keep the games the women's game is an amazing game they play some amazing tennis the men have their own characteristics. They play well. I just don't see the mix. I see when they do mix doubles is really the best where we combine the two. Awesome. Well, yeah, nice uh, off ramp to talk about uh, some different things. <laughs> Love Roger. Uh, back to uh, the project management world. You know, we're we're getting kind of close. Maybe one uh, yeah. one or two minutes on this one is think about all of the material you've created, all the content you've created, and if you had to pick out like one or two nuggets to share with a new PMO leader. Yeah. What would you share with them as, you know, you don't know anything about them or anything, but just as a generality mm-hmm. to be able to say, here's the two, one or two things you really need to be focused on or think about as you start your journey as a PMO leader. First thing, be nice, be nice. Like just be approachable, be someone that it's, you know, that you're not pushing a ton of policies and policing and, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. Be nice. And, and if you're nice and people get you get along with people, it goes tremendously a long way in the success of you in this role, right? And then, you know, the other thing is put some basics in place. Listen to your customers. Listen to your leadership. What are the pain points that they're trying to solve? 
and then start adapting those uh, pain points. Crawl, walk, run. You don't have to solve everything tomorrow. Make it a journey. Make it a roadmap. But really outline and listen to your leadership and listen to your customers and listen to your people. And that combination, those three things will make you be and will help you be successful. Yeah, that's great advice, Bill. And and the reality, right, is we all have customers, whether they're internal or yeah. external. And if we don't listen to them, uh, we we lose business. And yeah. if you lose business in a PMO, we have to go to your book and look at uh, how to shut down a PMO. <laughs> right? Shut down, yeah. Or Google, because I got lots of stuff out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bill, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. A really great conversation. Um, what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you? And what do you have coming up maybe uh, that people need to be aware of that get ready to tune into? Yeah. So more and more classes. So I'll be rolling out classes like crazy. So uh, best way to get a hold of me is Bill Dow at DowPublishingLLC.com. So Bill Dow at DowPublishingLLC.com. And then my BillDowPMP.com website. I put all my information, all my webinars, all my stuff up there as well. So those two are the two um, ways to get a hold of me. Fantastic. And of course, there's social media, LinkedIn, uh, you're out yeah. there on that. And then the PMO Definitely. Leader website. Yeah. Uh, we're fortunate to have Bill and some of his content on our site as well. We're one PMO world and we're building one community. And we're glad to have you part of that, Bill. Thanks so thank much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And certainly thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, be sure to visit projectmanagementofficehours.com. Check out all the great content, listing of upcoming shows. Uh, all the past shows we've had, and we have a great schedule of live chats coming up with leaders from around the world. Uh, our next show will be with Frank Salatis, uh, father of International Project Management Day. Uh, we've got Jennifer Bridges and David Knorr coming up, Stuart Easton, David Barrett, Elena Hill, Danielle Torley, Hamutal Weitz, and Daniel Zitter from Israel, Antonio Nieto Rodriguez, uh, Karsten Lay from Vietnam, uh, so a, a powerhouse packed lineup uh, to get us through the first half of this year. And then, of course, great shows the second half of the year. A reminder that these shows are also recorded. So be sure to subscribe to Project Management Office Hours podcast on Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, or whatever your platform of choice is. And thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad and the PMO Leader. Uh, visit their websites to learn more about the offerings they have and become a member of the PMO Leader Global Community where you can interact with your peers and be part of that one PMO community. That's it for now. Office hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours. Thanks for listening to another episode of Project Management Office Hours with PMO Joe. You're not alone in your project management journey. We're here to help you achieve your goals. Subscribe to Project Management Office Hours on your favorite podcast platform to catch all of our episodes and hear industry leaders share their story and secrets to success.